The million dollar question, how do entrepreneurs transition from self-employed to owning a business that turns a profit? My name is Chris Waters and this podcast has the million dollar answer. Welcome to CEO Secrets. Hey guys, it's your host, Chris Waters of CEO Secrets. Welcome back. I've got a top producing broker out of New York City, Patrick Lilly on the show. This guy has sold over a billion dollars worth of real estate in his career. He's also a transformational coach, and this is his second time on CEO Secrets. Patrick, welcome back. How are you? Thanks, buddy. It's good to be here. Hey, I think last time you were on the show, it was right before COVID hit. What has it been like in New York City over the past year? Wow. What that's been a that's well, this is a good comparison. So you know how the rest of the United States real estate markets went crazy over the last um for 2020 and the beginning of 21. Sure. Uh towns like New York City and Boston and downtown San Francisco all died. So I everybody was having their best year. I had my worst year in a long, long, long time. And it's finally picked up lately, thank God. Um, You know, I think because of the vaccinations, I think because of the change of administration, people are coming back to New York now. And so we're actually in a hot market. We're just a year and a half behind everybody. But it's nice to be busy again because, you know, it's interesting. You know, I agreed to do this talk with you right now. I've got like all these new listings. I've got, um, we're moving. I sold my home up here in Hudson Valley and I'm moving to another home this week, both on Thursday. So backers are downstairs. I'm trying, I'm doing this from my bedroom because it's too noisy out in the rest of the house. So, but I am so grateful to be busy again. I, I can't even begin. I can't even begin to tell you. So is, are there, you know, for anybody watching the show that's looking for investment properties, are there deals to be had? Like oh, sure. can you get stuff like 20, 30% below market value in New York City? Is that is that a real well, possibility? You know, that's, an, that's an odd question to say because market value is only what it is at any given time. So mm-hmm. for something to be below market, it's just that that what's selling now is 10 to 20% less than what it was selling for a year, a uh, right. year and a half ago. Yeah. So so the market value is what it is. But yeah, it's a good time to buy right now. We already hit the bottom. The bottom was about I'd say it was about the end of January. So people that were going into contract end of January, February, the beginning of March, they're the ones that got the very best deals. Um, But they're still excellent deals compared to a year and a half ago, for sure. And then, you know, I also sell up here in Hudson Valley. And that market has been crazy the whole time. So it's a tale of two cities. So... And I heard from a broker that New York City kind of hit a a low in 2015, and it's been pretty stagnant since 2015. Would you say that's accurate and from a pricing perspective? Absolutely not. Um, No. no. It it leveled off. It became became an even market. It it was neither a buyer's market nor a seller's market from 2015 to COVID. And then COVID, it turned into a buyer's market, a serious buyer's market. Yeah. Now it's back to even again, where you know things are selling. We're still having some bidding wars now, which we haven't had in a long time. Things that sat on the market for a couple of years are going into contracts. So no, it was. I think that was a misrepresentation that two fifteen to two nineteen was a uh, were buyer's market. It was not at all. Okay, and I'm just kind of curious from a, a pricing perspective. You know, when I think about New York City real estate, I think, you know, two, three, four thousand dollars a square foot. Is that still pretty much the norm for something? And it depends on location. So, you know, in Manhattan, south of 110th Street, you never could find anything under a thousand dollars a square foot. You know, even, you know, if it was a walk up, you just couldn't find it. Now you're finding things at seven fifty eight, nine fifty a square foot, which is, you know, low for us. But the better locations, like being on Fifth Avenue, Park Avenue, that sort of thing, they're still selling it two and three thousand dollars a square foot, as opposed to to twenty five hundred and thirty five hundred and four thousand a square foot. So, were some of those units were they up to four thousand square feet at a certain point? Oh sure, oh sure. And, now, and, and you know, so, there, like, there, are, there are a lot of large luxury units because so much international wealth comes and buys a second or third home in the city. So just for frame of reference, so like, let's say, for example, at the peak, there was a unit, you know, selling for 4,000 square foot. What's it selling for now? 
It's probably down to about 32 to 35, somewhere okay. in that range, depending on how desperate the owner is. The calculation that's a little bit more difficult to get to is there is a plethora of very high-end properties on the market. So the relative inventory is much higher in terms of availability in that sort of square footage than, say, a one-bedroom apartment. So consequently, you're, if somebody has to sell, you're going to see a better deal at that price point. One of the things on resales with wealthy people, they generally don't have to resell. You know, they can sit out the market is generally the case. So I'm just curious. So if I was interested in buying a place in the city, what's the price point where it's kind of a sweet time to buy and you could get a lucrative deal? Like what's that price range? Um, it could be any price range. It could be as low as, as 300,000. It can be as high as uh, 25 million or even higher. There's deals to be had across the city. So it's not a specific price range. It's really who's hurting and needs help out. So you can imagine if you're a developer and you can't really rent out your units and you have all these things that you were planning on selling in 2020 and they didn't sell at all, you're going to be more negotiable than a person that doesn't have to sell. Mm -hmm. And you know, you're under more pressure from the, the bank loans to make something come through. So like for instance, the, the last three deals that I did that were above two and a half million in this last month, you know, we bid, we bid on five, six apartments on each one of them and just saw who would give us the best deal. Mm -hmm. Um, and everybody else is doing that too. So you would put multiple offers in at the same time and see who would negotiate. And you'd, you'd let them know we're, you know, we're bidding on multiple properties. So we're going to, we're going to play this off on you. But even in the under the million price range, you know, they're still selling for, let's say an apartment that used to sell for 950 is probably right now selling for about 875. Okay. So not like huge drop, but I mean, maybe 10%. Yeah. 10 to 12. Yeah. I think in the lower price points, I'd say 10 to 12% is accurate. And, and what's I'm the, some, it's desperate, but what's the hot spot of New York city right now? Like where's the trendy place for everybody to be? You know, frankly, all of Manhattan is hot. The first half of Brooklyn is hot. It's funny during COVID Brooklyn fared much better than Manhattan because Brooklyn has for the most part, doesn't have the number of, of high density that Manhattan does. So if you were a townhouse broker that specialized in Brooklyn, and a townhouse is just you know, a single or multifamily home in, in, uh, in New York, it's different from what other people would call a townhouse. Those brokers had some of their best years ever last year during COVID because people were moving out of Manhattan and wanted to get it to a less dense area, you know, out of fear of catching the disease. Right. So Brooklyn was really, really hot. We're starting to see that slow down a bit. We're seeing Manhattan pick up relative because people are moving back in. There's our pockets of opportunity. You know, is there one hot area right now? I, would, I wouldn't say no. I would say across the board that people are moving back into prime Manhattan and prime Brooklyn. So like when you think about different areas of town, there's, I, I, and I'm, you know, not super familiar with New York City, but there's, I think, Upper East Side, Upper West Side, Trifecta, Midtown, downtown, sure. is it Trifecta? Is, what's the name? Tri Tribeca. 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 <laughs> Tribeca. I like that. I, like that. <laughs> I think there's a restaurant in Austin called Trifecta. Oh, okay. Um, and then uh, like, so, and then what, Battery Park area and... Greenwich Village, uh, Chelsea. Yeah, 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 so like, what's like the the trendy... Out of those specific areas, what's like the trendy area? I can't really say. Manhattan is already so developed to say something is trendy over another area is not the case. It really becomes what, your, what price point can you afford mm -hmm. and then which neighborhood matches up with your personality the best. So okay. downtown tends to be a little less formal, um, a little bit younger, a little bit more hip. Upper East Side and Upper West tends to be a little bit older and a little bit more family oriented. Not always. I mean, there's exceptions to this, obviously. So if you were a society matron, you'd probably live on the Upper East Side. If um, you were an artist, you almost invariably live downtown or in Brooklyn. And, you know, the scale of different neighborhoods is different. So like 
the most of the West Village is only six stories tall for the most of the buildings, whereas Midtown, most of the buildings are, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 uh, stories tall. So your relationship to how light comes into the streets is very different. And it's a lot about individuals' personalities and what they can afford. So example, the West Village is one of the most expensive locations in all of Manhattan. And it's because it's a combination of who lives there, uh, the architecture and property types, and you know the uh, how light can come into the space. So all those things affect it. But I wouldn't say there's a trendy area right now. We're really just recovering. Is that where most of the celebrities live? West Village? Tribeca, Soho, and West Village tend to be the biggest. One of the reasons Tribeca is really popular with a lot of celebrities is that they're not through streets. So you can have your car pull up to your building and you can run into your building and not be seen. So there's that ability to get out and it, without a lot of street traffic and to get in and out of your home without having visibility there. So, and, you know, actors tend to be more creative types and creative types tend to more, not always, but they tend to live downtown or in Brooklyn. You know, one of the opportunities, which is interesting is, and this is, I'm not, this is not a political statement. You can imagine in really progressive areas like New York city, Trump is not popular. Mm -hmm. Um, In fact, just the opposite. He's probably hated for the most part. The buildings with his name on it, Trump Tower, Trump Palace, they're not faring well because if, you know, if you're just a regular New Yorker, you would not feel good about buying in Trump Tower. You, you're, you'd be embarrassed to do it. So the number of people who are willing to buy there and then other people who may, you know, who may have political beliefs that along Trump's beliefs also are not buying there because they realize that, you know, it, it may not look good for their business. So consequently, it's, that's one of the buildings that there's really good deals on our Trump buildings right now, because mm-hmm. they're going substantially lower than 10 or 12% off. Do you, do you think that, man, that's such a great uh, point to bring up. Do you think the, that those buildings will be sold and rebranded at some point by the Trump family or, do well, you... they're condos, so they don't actually own all the units, but they okay. may own some units, and they were the ones that converted the buildings to either condo or co-op status. Mm-hmm. But they have long-term management deals, and they had the right to put the name on it. At some point when those contracts expire, I suspect the names will be coming off just about all the Trump buildings. What do you think that timeline is? It, it, the, it varies from contract to contract. So I would say already about five or six buildings have removed the Trump name already. Wow one of the buildings actually had to pay the Trump organization money to get the name off of the building, but it's not, his name is a damaged name in New York. So it's fascinating. You know, Trump is trying to, you know, Trump in the past has appealed to very wealthy urbanites in his buildings in New York and Chicago and San Francisco. I think he has a building in San Francisco. You know, those are not the type of people who are supporting him for the most part uh, politically. Whereas there's other parts of the country that he's extremely popular in. But then how do you take that high-end luxury bit and put it into other areas? Let's say I'm going to pick Arkansas for the for <laughs> lack of a better place. You know, what kind of product could he actually produce there that he could make the amount of money that he used to make here? It's, it's, it's going to be a tough haul for him financially. He's going to have to build a 2,000-home neighborhood. Yeah, That's fascinating. So I guess from, you know, the investor in me is thinking from a strategic perspective, it would make sense to buy, buy a unit in one of those buildings, you know, on the precipice of potentially the name changing and, you know, values being turned around, assuming. It's funny, David Osborne, the reason I'm bringing this up is David Osborne just reached out to me and said, are there any deals at Trump Tower? And uh, is it true what I'm hearing? And so that's that's why this is actually top of mind on this. Yeah, you know uh, that David lives here in Austin, actually. Oh yeah, I've been to I've been to David's house several times. He and oh, I are cool! Friends. That's yeah. awesome. Really cool. Um, and so you're you're uh, at a Keller Williams brokerage in New York? No, that- no, no. I was. Uh, I never was. They. Uh, oh, I'm they sorry. Gave- you're with Core. You're with. Yeah, Core. they gave me the Pinnacle Award. I think Keller Williams gave me the Pinnacle Award. I think they were trying to. I'm not think they were trying to recruit me heavy. Yeah. Uh, and so they gave me that big award and thought that might help. Didn't. <laughs> 
What? Um, but what it, got of, me fired. it got me fired from my last firm. Wow. What if, you know, speaking of deals and there's so many things I want to talk to you about, but the, speaking of deals, like one of the hardest things about New York City is there's not an MLS system, right? You have no, to. But we, have, we have a faux MLS now. Um, okay. And what I would call that is uh, a sharing of information between all of the firms through something we call Rolex. That's pretentious, isn't it? <laughs> and um, so we don't share all of the information, just the information about the specific properties for sale. It doesn't have as much information as, say, a real MLS has, but it's enough to co-broke. And so, like, we no longer have to call up a million people to set up an, uh, an appointment like we did in the old days. And now it's just, you know, you know, I can just go into our database and we all have separate databases so which is fascinating so corcoran's database and elements database and course database are three separate databases i would imagine as a brokerage you have to spend a lot of money scraping through property records to pull stuff active and pending and sold and keep an internal database for your brokers well no so our databases are pretty extensive through rolex so rolex does allow us to track past sales and current listings and that sort of thing. Okay, got it. So it's not it's not as bad as it used to be. So is it, I mean, where would a consumer so why go? Why don't you ask me why we don't have an MLS? Uh, why don't you have an MLS? This is pisses me off. This is like one of the, this is one of the things that just drives me crazy. And I'm going to piss some people off by what I'm going to say, and I don't care. The two largest firms in New York are Corcoran and Elliman. And they think that it's in their best interest not to have an MLS because it acts as a barrier to entry into the market. And uh, they're doing what's in their best interest, as opposed to my belief is you should be doing what's in the clientele's best interest. And an MLS is definitely in the clientele's best interest, not in uh, those two firms' interest. So if just one of those two firms, so if you're listening, if you're listening, Pam, or you're listening, Dottie, you know, all it takes is one of you two and everybody will do it, but they've decided against it. So, and I'm it sure makes they sense, have, right. I mean, I get it. it. Makes sense. You know, between the two of them, they're 50%, about 50% of the market. So they, they, they can pull that off. Unfortunately. What, what consumer facing portal are people using when they're looking for real estate in New York? Street easy is the primary portal and street easy was bought out by Zella. What a surprise. <laughs> That's my other pet peeve. Why did NAR ever sell Realtor.com to Murdoch? Why didn't they develop it for ourselves? It's a great Don't question. Get, that's just, okay. Those are my two rants for today. How's, how has Compass affected the brokerage world in New York City? Um, well, you know, they started here. The, this is their headquarters. They had lots and lots of funds to buy top agents. And they bought a lot of really good agents that I really like and respect. So there's some, they tried to buy me, but. Um, what prevented uh, they, you from going there? They didn't offer me enough money. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm really happy where I am. And I have some benefits here uh, where I am. And then, yeah. So I'm not going to go into more detail. Then what's the word on the street? You know, Compass went IPO and then they're, you know, they got devalued. What's the word on the street about just people's opinion on the future of Compass? And obviously a lot of agents have contracts ending these non-compete contracts, right? So, uh, so be a lot of turnover and a lot of people leaving the company. That's my belief is what will happen, Chris, is that they had to, in order to take their the the buyout price that they got, they had to. I think most of them signed a contract for four years. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it was. And the other thing is, is they gave them really high splits, higher than what the market gives in New York City. And then at that time, those splits are all going to be reevaluated because I just don't see how they could be making money at the splits and the money that they paid out. I just don't see how they're going to do it. I think what their goal was, and I could be wrong. I'm not a financial whiz. I think their goal was, was to go public with it, to get, get this massive uh, share. And then they would make their money that way. I'm not sure it's going to pan out because uh, they still have to make money and they're, they're paying people. Their splits are too high in my opinion for New York city. Your, so, fr your friends that are at Compass, are they happy with the company? And 
What yeah, I would, say, I would say most of them are happy. Some are a little disenchanted, but they have contracts. So even if they're disenchanted, what are they going to do? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, what's the incentive if they change your splits, right? Like what's the incentive to stay there? It's going to be problematic for them. Is they're the gonna... technology that amazing that you'll want to stay there? I have not experienced that myself from what I've been able to see. You know, they do claim that they are the kings of technology. I'm not sure that that is actually backed up in actuality. But again, I could be wrong there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, that, you know, unless they can go public and make a lot of money, I think it's going to be a little problematic down the road. But this is, let's, let's put a caveat on that, Chris. This is somebody who, when looking at whether or not I would accept their offer to go or to stay, I decided that what we're talking about now was probably going to happen. And so I made that decision to stay. Mm -hmm. um, and I had also been in a scenario where I worked, I was a top worker at the Coldwell Banker franchise for many years here and really good people at the top, but they, they didn't, they weren't well funded and they weren't, they didn't make a good business plan. Um, in my opinion. And when there was a drop in the market, they got really hurt and we had to, they had to shut down the franchise and, but really good people at the top. And, you know, I didn't want to be put in that position again, where I would be with a company that may have some problems down the road. So that was one of the factors that factored whether on why I stayed, if they had offered me more money, I probably would have gone. So what's interesting is in New York, Douglas Elliman and Corcoran have controlled a good chunk of the market for a really long time. Yeah. And now Compass is in that, in that conversation now. But it seems like most people that go into New York city to start a brokerage fail. What, I mean, what makes it so challenging to start a brokerage in New York city? Um, I think the biggest thing and re the reason things like discount firms don't work here, Redfin doesn't have a hold here. I, I saw my first Redfin broker on showing a listing today. I've never seen a Redfin broker come up in one of my listings before to show. I think it's because the majority of our listings are co-ops and not condos. And the, the process of buying a co-op is much more convoluted than buying a condo. Uh, or buying a single family home. So I, I think you have to have a knowledge base that I think a fresh start is hard for people to do. And the, plus the other thing, Chris, is that, you know, money's not in brokerages anymore. I mean, money's in successful teams. I mean, the last thing I would want to start right now is my own brokerage. Do you run across the, the guys for a million dollar listing? Do you see them? Uh, so Frederick, his partner, John Gomes, I interact with John a lot on some products, on some deals, especially my higher end things. They're showing two of my townhouses. His team is showing two of my townhouses tomorrow. But Frederick's moved out to, to LA, so we don't even see him tonight. And Ryan is beginning. I, I have dealt with Ryan's team. I've never even met Ryan. I don't think I have. And Ryan's starting his own brokerage firm that's going to be starting up in Soho. He, bought a whole building. It's amazing how the two of them, Frederick was a good broker before he went on that show. And I assume Ryan was, but I didn't really, I didn't, I didn't have as much interaction with him. It's amazing how they've taken that opportunity and that visibility and they've really grown their business. Yeah. I saw a video of Frederick riding a horse and I guess he's, he was like, you know, on this horse prancing out of the, the gates of this property as the gates were opening. And it was kind of a promo video for, uh, I guess, an office he's launching here in central Texas. Uh, you know, I was talking to, I was on a clubhouse call. I think it was a clubhouse where one of the agents was uh, is on Frederick's team in, I think, the Dallas area. And hmm. it was interesting how a lot of the local brokers were really being rude to his team. And, you know, I told the agent, listen, give them some time. They're just scared. They're afraid you're going to they're going to take over the market and hmm. uh, just be compassionate towards uh, how mean people are being to you. I mean, you know, I have a team in Austin and a couple other markets and, you know, the market share, there's a ceiling to the market share with the team model. So there's not anything really for anybody to be concerned about. I mean, if I was Element or Corcoran, 
and I had the pocketbook of Compass, I would obviously be concerned, you know, with their ability to buy agents out. But, you know, it's difficult for a team to reach the same market penetration as a, as a brokerage with hundreds and hundreds of agents. Yeah. But your profitability is so much higher. That's what's so great. Yeah. Or it should be higher. Right. You know, it's interesting. You know, I, I tell people this all the time. Like, I don't really see a big difference between brokerages and teams, you know, like the teams don't really need the brokerage. I mean, the, the broker doesn't really do anything for them. I mean, you're paying for your own E&O policy. You've got your own branding, like, you know, the back office compliance, like you pretty much have to do all the heavy lifting on that. You know, it's like, I don't really see much. I don't see any difference now between teams and brokerages. It it may be a little different in New York in that a lot of my costs are carried by my firm. So a lot of my marketing costs are carried by my firm. We get help from our marketing department, from our PR department. They can do things like we have a PR firm. I can't, as an individual small team. I can't afford a PR firm, but then I can go to them and use their PR firm when I need it. And then they're able to assist us in doing like they create our brochures and make everything. So for at least in New York, for me, it's interesting in New York, I, it makes sense for me to be with core, but when I sell upstate in Hudson Valley, it makes sense to be on my own. So I'm with Patrick Lilly team, LLC as the brokerage up in Hudson Valley, which is basically a two person team. And then in core, then, and when I'm selling in New York city, then I'm with core. I I go to the Inman event in New York city. Uh, Hopefully they have that this coming January. I don't know. I haven't heard, I haven't heard anything yet. So when I've talked to brokers in New York, it sounds like the commission splits in New York are less favorable for the agent to your point, because the brokerage, does quite a bit more for the agents. Yes. So most firms top out at 70% to their agents as 70% is living. Now that doesn't mean you can't negotiate a higher one if you're really producing. So, and I won't go any further than that, but most firms top out 78%, whereas in a lot of markets, they'll top out at 90%, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, So, but then the firms cover more things than your firms cover. I actually like that model that we have here because when problems, you know, like when legal problems arise or people are threatening me, I can just say, Core, take over this. I don't even want to hear about it. Just tell me what you need and uh, take care of it. And when you're on your own, that's all on your shoulders. And um, I I very much am appreciative of that. Plus the guy at the head of our company is a really good guy. And I really feel like Sean Osher, I really feel like who's ever at the top of the company really sets the standard in terms of ethics and, and how you treat each other and how you treat other brokers. I've heard him talk on stage before. He was talking about how the margins in the business have gotten so slim and how yeah. it, he's, you know, very, very busy, very proactive, long days. I mean, still yeah. wearing a lot of hats and yep. the, the margins are very small and it's, yep. it's a, it's a difficult, difficult business. Yeah, it is. And it's gotten tighter for him. He does, uh, our company does a lot of new developments. And I think that's a big chunk of, I think that's one of the things that keeps us running is his new developments, because that brings in a lot of cash. Is he, um, is he out there producing as a broker? Yeah, yeah. It was interesting. uh, During COVID, when things sold, sold down, he started actively selling more because the there weren't new developments coming on the market, which had been his previous focus. But yeah, he, uh, he has a lot of really high end clients that he he deals with himself. How, how difficult, like if someone's watching this show and they're mesmerized by the big sale prices in New York and they want to move to New York to sell real estate, how hard is it to get started in the real estate industry in New York? I think if you can be a good broker anywhere else, you can be a good broker here. It's just, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to start out with the leads that you want. So when I started in the industry, 30, seven years ago. Uh, I didn't know anybody. I moved here from Missouri. My average sales price back then was $75,000. In New York Uh, City? Yeah. Well, this was 37. This was seven years ago. And I was selling, you know, studios and one bedroom apartments because I was a young kid and, you know, what fancy person is going to list with me. But over time, you know, 
I'm up to 15 and $20 million apartments. So yeah, I mean, unless you're really well connected, um, you're going to have to put in some work. But if you're willing to put in work and you're smart and people like you, yeah, of course you can succeed here. So some of the, you know, you can obviously buy leads through Google and Facebook and all of these things. Do you find that wealthy people use those platforms and will connect with the broker? Like somebody buying a 15 to $20 million apartment, are they going to, you know, submit their information on some website and then like by chance talk to a broker that ends up selling them a unit? Like, is that a, a realistic expectation? Mm, yes and no. Really high end wealthy people. No, but I get... I've gotten leads from like referral exchange and up nest where they, they actively go after leads um, for, you know, the two to $4 million range quite a bit. What would you Um, consider the upper echelon? Like, you know, where 10 million plus. Okay. So you're never going to get connected with the buyer at 10 million plus through some lead platform. I'm in fact, I'm really suspicious when uh, I do get that lead, I feel like it's a broker acting like trying to figure out how the system works and they're pretending they're a broker. So um, I haven't had one that's actually panned out and I'm really suspicious and sort of, you know, like, is this how much is this legit? If you watch Million Dollar Listing, right, these guys are connected to these personal representatives and attorneys. Is that yeah. accurate? You know, because like sometimes TV, yes. right? Like, what can you believe? On TV, what's no, there's, you know, we all have our referral sources and you create relationships in any place. So, and New York is an attorney driven state in terms of contracts where it's against the law for a real estate broker to draft a contract in New York. An attorney has to draft it and, and negotiate it. I mean, we can negotiate the deals, but they negotiate the contract. And um, so having relationships with accountants with business managers, with attorneys, with estate managers. Those are really important things to have. So like there's certain attorneys that they always just refer their client when their client calls them up and says, who do you have a suggestion who to use? They go, Oh, call Patrick. And, um, you know, they treat me really well and I make sure I take really good care of their clients. What's what type of attorney is that? Uh, real estate attorney. Real. Okay. So real estate attorneys. Yeah. Yeah. But it also, uh, attorneys with general practices that want to cover as many fields as possible for their clients. What about like probate attorneys and divorce attorneys? It's hard to get those relationships. You know, a few people have done it. I haven't really tried. Um, one of my coaching clients is working on doing that, but it's not, it, it takes, a, it takes a while to make that happen. How like, Man, how, you know, when you think about uh, the team model, which is predicated on giving a lot of opportunities to your your team members, like it, it seems so difficult to create a scalable lead generation source for the team model. So like Ryan Serhan and Frederick. Back in, uh, back in the day when I had my, my team was big and we were ranked in the top 100 agents in, in, the, in the nation. We did that primarily from expired listings and from me hiring a a person to actually call the expired listings and be in charge of that program. So that was the main source of leads at that time for me. And there's so many different ways that um, you can generate leads. I got to the point where I just was looking at my profitability under that major, you know, we, we were an eight person team then. I looked at the profitability versus my happiness and, you know, I've gotten to the point where happiness counts and managing people and listening to their stuff when they're on my team and they were really good agents. Don't get me wrong. It's it's draining. It's draining. And I decided, you know, I've got good money. Let's make the team smaller. Let's make it much more profitable and do less deals. That's not really answering your question, though, is it? Yeah. How's, how are guys like Ryan Serhan and Frederick Eklund, how are they supplying enough leads to keep all these agents busy? I mean, oh, well, obviously because, they... because of their exposure on, on television, they're getting leads where they're, re- they're calling them directly. They're, like clients are reaching out to them directly. You know, and part of it's because they think, oh, I'd love to be on TV. You know, that could be one reason they'll reach out. Another reason they'll reach out is, um, oh, he probably carries 
he has the clientele for my price point. So, oh, that's definitively how they're generating so many so many leads is because they're exposure on television. That's interesting. Frederick moved to L.A. I didn't know that. I haven't watched Million Dollar Listing in a long time. Yeah, so John's pretty much running it here in the city. Um, I'm sure Frederick comes in quite a bit, too. I'm sure he kept an apartment here, but yeah. And and they're also doing a lot in Miami, I think. Yeah, it's pretty, it's great to see what they're doing. It's Yeah, like you mentioned, the show, it really propelled those guys, and they're kind of taking yep. the bull by the horns and taking it to the next level. Yeah, yep. Well, um, just to change uh, sub- subjects for a quick minute, um, I know you do transformational coaching. Yes. Tell me more about that. What does that mean, transformational coaching? Like, what are the type of people you help? What kind of problems are you helping them overcome? Well, I'm not going to give any names, but so one of my coaching clients right now is one of the top brokers in the country, and he has an incredible business. And he works 24 seven and he doesn't really have a life outside of work. And so figuring out a way to envision what his life could be like, and then making those changes and finding ways to make it happen is how you transform his life. So he's living a life that he wants to live Versus a life where, frankly, he's living a very reactive life where he's always, you know, reacting to clients and 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 fires and and dealing with everything that he needs to do. And the ultimate goal there is just to bring more joy into his life um, and still make it profitable for him. And that will ultimately mean working less hours, being smarter about how you delegate, being conscious of when you're going into work mode just because you're bored. Now, if you have to have an addiction, work's not a bad addiction, (laughs) but um, it is often an addiction. And so how do you live a full and meaningful life in, you know, real estate should fund your life. It shouldn't be your life. So that sort of transformation is, does that make sense for for that? Then there's um, another one of my clients right now is at Keller Williams. She's really She's, she's good. She's going to be one of the top agents in the city, I believe. She's really, really good. And again, it's really about how can we bring a little bit more joy and happiness in your life because we're not focusing on the right things, but still allow you to, if you want to give 90% of your time to your business, great, she does. Let's focus on how we can make your life more meaningful and um, help you to grow your business because that's really important to her. Where the first client is already at the top of his game, there's not much more he can grow to. He could, but he's, he's not going to. She still wants to grow. So how do we help her to grow her business and yet at the same time bring a little bit more joy into her life so that everyday experiences? How do you go into a negotiation so that it can be a joyous, fun thing as opposed to something that you're dreading to do? Because when you dread to do something, then your the quality of your life sucks. Sure, Patrick, we, what are you, what are you reading right now? What are your books? What do you, what books do you look to as inspiration and uh, staying, staying happy, happy. Be productive by Roger Hall, The uh, Realization by Paul Selleck. What is that about? Beyond, bring that one up again. Oh, uh, that is. That's a really out there spiritual book. So uh, let's, well, let me tell you what it says. This book is the most audacious of the guides teachings today. It describes how anyone who chooses can claim the true expression of who they are, what the guides call the divine self, the true self, the Christ itself. So um, I think a lot of people would consider that to be real woo woo stuff. I love it. What's your one all time favorite book that you've, that you've read? The best real estate book by far is The Million Dollar Agent by Gary Keller. That is by far the best book, in my opinion. My favorite nonfiction, my favorite fiction book is The Golden Notebook by Doris Lessing. My favorite nonfiction. I read more nonfiction than anything else. What's The Golden Notebook about? It's a, so she's an incredible author. It's about that she had. She had a different notebook for each aspect of her life. So 
a notebook about relationships, a notebook about her, her writing, a notebook about um, her family. And she realized that her life was really segmented. And she eventually, by the end of the book, comes up with the golden notebook, which then covers all of, she no longer needs four or five separate notebooks. She has one notebook to cover her entire life because she's being consistent throughout the different aspects of her life, which kind of goes into transformational coaching too. Interesting. What, are you? A, what am I reading? Yeah. Uh, let's see what's on my desk that I'm reading. I always have a couple the way, books on I, me. On the shirt, I have the same shirt that you uh, have on I, yeah. and I, I know good, where you got it too. Good taste. Yeah. Um, well, the book on my on my desk right now, which this is a plug for my own book, it's oh, the nice. Million Dollar Real Estate Team. That's a good plug. Um, but, um, you know, let's see. Probably the best book I've read recently is this book here, Atomic Habits. And I've heard, but I haven't read it. You know, it's, it's a really easy read. And, you know, something I took away from this book is the author uh, is James Clear. He talks about how a lot of us will like fall in this trap of focusing on the end result. Like I want to make a hundred million dollars or I want ABC and, and how you actually have to think about it is like, if you want to achieve X, you need to be thinking about like, what do you have to change inside yourself? So it's like the work, the work begins inside to accomplish that exterior goal. And, you know, if, if you're a high driver personality, it's so easy to get super focused on the, the end result and not the, you know, the things you have to change internally. And so that was a really great takeaway. Um, but yeah, this has been probably one of my favorite books I've read recently. Um, I recently picked up a book that uh, Warren Buffett recommends all the time. Uh, Warren Buffett said this is a book, you know, that really helped kind of influence and, you know, affect him as an investor called the... Um, the Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham. Benjamin Graham was Warren Buffett's, you know, kind of mentor uh, as he was growing up. So, would you like to have dinner with Warren Buffett? That would be, yeah, it'd be incredible. I got the feeling like he's just like one of the coolest guys ever. And um, you know, we don't even have to talk about investing. We could just talk about, you know, what about we could talk about a movie. I don't care. I yeah. just think he'd be an interesting person to, to sit down and have a meal with. I do too. There, You know what's fascinating is uh, if you ever watch on YouTube, him and Charlie Munger talk. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. You know, Warren Buffett's f- obviously fascinating, but I don't know, Charlie Munger may even be more fascinating. Yeah, like yeah. when the guy, like he doesn't talk a lot, but it's like when he says one or two sentences, it takes 10 minutes to digest what he just said. <laughs> There actually another great book, man, this is an amazing book. It's about Charlie Munger, but it's from Darwin to Munger called Seeking Wisdom and written by uh, Peter Bevelin. And it's, this is another really fascinating book. So just, you know, just understanding like the logic Charlie Munger goes through is pretty fascinating. And Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, they both say the smartest person they've ever met in their life is Charlie Munger. And and when you hear him speak, like if you listen to a YouTube thing of him at the uh, Berkshire Hathaway shareholder meetings they do once a year, I mean, it's when he speaks, it's just so deep and it just <laughs> takes a long time to digest what he says, but it it's his, his logic is, is pretty incredible. So those are my, those are my top books right now. Awesome. Well, hey, this has been a great show. Um, thank you so much for being on, Patrick. Uh, My it's always, uh, yeah, it's always a pleasure having you on. Um, I'm, I, I don't know how, but uh, like, if me or anybody listening is interested in uh, finding some of those deals in the Trump building, <laughs> what's, oh, the best, what's the what's the best me. way to do that? PatrickLillyTeam.com. L i l l y. PatrickLillyTeam.com. Just go there and reach out to me or. Yeah, I'm happy to. Sh- I'm happy to show you any deals anywhere. Are those um, Trump uh, units for sale that are distressed? Would you find those on Easy Street online or would Street you Easy Street Easy Street? Easy. Street. I love Trifecta and Easy Street. Street <laughs> Easy and Trifecta. This is what you're you get close. when you talk to a Texas a Texas you're native. Close. You're close. Yeah, if you go on Street Easy, you'll see them yourself. You don't need to see them from me. Yeah, and then obviously people can reach. You'll out see to them on Zillow. You'll see them on Zillow too. Okay, 
and then reach out to you, Patrick. Uh, you said patricklilyteam.com? Yep. And if uh, Patrick at patricklilyteam.com and uh, um, uh, or go to our website and just leave a message there or uh, call me 917-863-7873. Hey, I'm, oh. I might seriously hit you up. I mean, I, I'm looking for a steal of a deal, so I might hit you up. Oh, give me a call, Chris. That'd be great. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I feel like me and David Osborne were bred from the same cloth. He's a good guy. He's a good guy. He's, he is a good dude. Yeah. We, well, we, hey, fight, we fight sometimes, but he's a good guy. Hey, it's this has been a great show. Can't wait to post this. Guys, um, if this is your first time tuning in, be sure to hit that subscribe button. If you're looking to buy real estate or need any kind of transformational coaching, hit up Patrick Lilly. And uh, until next time, we'll see you then. Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks, Chris.